<clears throat> okay, J.B. Fisher von Erlach. <clears throat> uh, his son, also an architect and an important architect, has uh, different uh, initials, the first two ones, two, uh, the first two. Uh, this was uh, the man without the head yet. Uh, here he is, uh, uh, you know, an architect, a very accomplished architect. He worked for the emperor and uh, for an elite. Uh, usually architects at that time were posed, you know, were, were painted in this posture, you know, of some kind, some kind of a authority and, and, and seer. Some drawings by Fischer von Erlach. He drew a lot and inspired by uh, the history of architecture and not just European history of architecture. And, uh, you know, these are all kinds of temples and all kinds of architectures that, she, that he drew and then they were engraved and they, the engravings uh, reached many people in, in various countries. So he was a very uh, informed, educated uh, architect uh, and uh, with an encyclopedic view of architecture. These were published also in books and, you know, it, it's a very interesting architecture. I mean, even here, look, look at the plan at the, uh, in, the, in the lower corner, left corner. And then, uh, you know, the, the perspectival drawing. Uh, there is a lot to learn, actually, from, from these engravings. This is Karlskirche, which he built in, in, in Vienna. In Vienna, we are, we are going to see it in detail, uh, a major work by him. He, he was also a sculptor. You will see also some sculptures by him, fountains and so on. An artist, you know, I, I mean, uh, uh, with the exception of our time, uh, you know, architect, architects were usually also artists. This seems to be difficult to comprehend for us today, you know, where the artist in the architect is discouraged and, 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 and this is strange. And unnatural is 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 uh, unproductive as well. But what what am I talking about? In in, in the university, we do, you are not even taught the history of art. It should be taught every year, and it isn't. As if it is irrelevant art to architects is unbelievable to me. Actually, I don't understand it. And then we complain that the, that the students are apathetic and, uh, you know, bored and uninspired. Well, or you cannot inspire them with rules and regulations. You inspire them with art. I mean, this man was very immersed in, in, in the art and architecture of his time and not only his time. And at that time, the, the means of communication were much poorer than ours. You know, uh, you can imagine such a man in order to, to know about the certain temples of a certain place of a certain time, you know, there were very, very few books. There was no internet, there was no TV. And yet, paradoxically, his uh, culture was encyclopedic. We are spoiled by comparison. We truly have at our disposal all the knowledge of the world. And yet we are apathetic. We have no inspiration. We are bored. We are blasé. And I wonder why. Sculptures. As I said, he was also a sculptor in Prague. Here they are, these, uh, these uh, groups uh, were, were sculpted by him. Why are we not using sculptures again when we build? Why? 
Why? Because, well, actually, there are certain models now in the 21st century who return, but not us. It takes us a long time to understand that architecture is supposed to collaborate with the artists. The artists, poor artists, they may, some of them have nothing to eat. They would love to collaborate with the architects, to cooperate, to work together, to, to make the building beautiful. Why are we not collaborating with them? I would be curious to know what you think. Why? Truly, I mean, what is going on with architecture? We only make white cubes. Aren't we bored of them? I mean, for how long are we going to continue to work like this? Covering the, the world with white cubes and they are not even perfect or, uh, you know, longing for the absolute. Here you see all of a sudden these, you know, sculptural groups, they, um, they, they have the power to, to create emotion, to, to stir up imagination, to ask yourself, because it's maybe also a narration, uh, they, they tell a story, a story I do not know, but I imagine there is a, there is a meaning here and, and there is beauty. Yes, I think there is beauty, a fountain. Do we, do we do fountains? I think Bucharest and any city would do quite well if we would design fountains. In fact, I even proposed, and maybe I'll launch a competition for fountains in Bucharest, you know, and it could be, they, they could be in any city. But let's start maybe with Bucharest, with the bigger city, to design fountains, you know, modernistic, like belonging to our time. Fountains in the corners of some streets, in squares, in parks. In a fountain is a, is a, is a very nice uh, urban presence and necessary. Also, it refreshes the air. It can be done. It's just that what is missing is the will, the willfulness to do it, the desire to do it, the inspiration to do it. I don't know. I truly feel I'm actually revolted against my time and my place. I don't understand. It's, 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 it's like we are, we, are, we are ruining our lives working for prose, you know, P-R-O-S-E in the, in the bad sense of the word prose, because there is also a good sense. I mean, in other words, we are doing prosaic works. Architecture. He built a lot. If we are to consider only the Schönbrunn Palace, which is a vast architectural work, and it would be enough to have uh, Fischer von Erlach, uh, you know, uh, be remembered. He didn't work alone. He, even his son continued his work, but this was a large palace and he didn't build just this building. Also, there are buildings in the gardens. The gardens are also kind of similar to, to the gardens of Versailles. And, uh, you know, it's a, it was a major, uh, major constructive effort. And it can be seen and it is seen, you know, the tourists are flooding when they go to Vienna or Vienna, they, they go maybe straight to Schönbrunn. He also built this building, which is uh, magnificent on top of a hill. So the Schönbrunn Palace was built by um, uh, Fischer von Erlach, Johann Bernard Fischer von Erlach. But it's easier to remember the name, even though it's the same name like his sons, uh, Fischer von Erlach. If you remember the two initials, JB, you know, is, is enough. But if you, even if you call him Fischer von Erlach, as, as in fact he is often known, is fine. Do you see these sculptures, the grotto, the, the you know, the, the, all these things add something to nature. So there is the interplay between nature and the work, the artistic works of man. Why is it that we don't do these sort of things? I think the main reason is the lack of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, exaltation, of exuberance, of desire. 
So you see, this is the Schönbrunn Palace, and here in the back is this uh, pavilion, which is quite large on top of the on top of the hill. So the, the entrance is from here, and then uh, this is the palace, and then you move upwards on the hill and you, you discover the other building. Of course, this is not a proletarian uh, architecture. This was meant for the emperor and uh, the elite. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe beauty doesn't uh, have uh, frontiers and class distinctions. Now, of course, when it was used, it was used by, by the elite. But, you know, now everybody is welcome to visit and so on. This is the other building on top of the hill. Again, the, the, the presence of the sculptures is, uh, is uh, fundamental. In as much as the decorations and the, you know, the ornaments here are. Even the, the, the greenhouse, uh, and uh, I love this greenhouse, I think is, uh, it's actually amazing now that it is from uh, no more than 250 years ago. I think it is very impressive. Now, the Karlskirche, which I mentioned, we saw uh, an engraving with it, a very fa uh, famous and uh, fundamental uh, architectural work for, uh, for the capital of, uh, of Austria. This is the plan. And uh, what can we say? It's, 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 an excellent, uh, it's an excellent building. You almost feel like saying that this is by Bernini. It's not by Bernini. I actually don't know if he did it himself, the sculpture, but he did the building. Uh, and uh, it's right in the heart of, uh, of Vienna. Here on the left is a modernistic building, another museum of art, and there are all kinds of buildings here that have importance for for the city of this of, for for this very important city, Vienna. Now these are, of course, modeled uh, on the on the on the columns, even Trajan's column in uh, in uh, in Rome. In Rome, Trajan's column, as you know, has the base reliefs with uh, scenes from the war between the Dacians and the Romans, where, in fact, uh, the, the most noble figure and, and and I read this in a book written by a an American historian, not a Romanian one, but he said that uh, the head of Decebalus, who, which the head was brought to, to Rome as a proof that he died, he committed suicide, is depicted with such a dignity that uh, uh, shows that the, 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 the warriors, the Roman soldiers had great respect for Decebalus and so did the sculptor because uh, the, 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 the face of Decebalus is, uh, is, uh, is shown with a lot of dignity.
like sportives, I think true soldiers are uh, respectful, even if they defeat their enemy, if the enemy fought uh, with, uh, with the courage. I think uh, um, I, I, there is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, reciprocal respect, I think, between two armies that both fight with, with courage and, um, and uh, sportives in a competition. It always moves me when I see sportives uh, after an incredible fight at the end embracing each other. Uh, it's a very beautiful human recognition that beyond the competition, beyond the fight, there is a, a oneness, a togetherness even. Of course, in the case of a sportive a sports competition is not tragic like it is in the case of a war. The Austrian National Library in Vienna, uh, another impressive building, maybe not so much towards the outside, but inside. Uh, personally, it turns me off so much whiteness and great, great grayness, but, uh, but uh, the inside is, uh, is, is splendid. I mean, look at this. Now, of course, this was an imperial library and uh, You almost feel like touching no book, uh, just just to look at them, you know, adorning the walls. As opposed to this library, the library built by Zaha Hadid uh, in the same city in Vienna, in Vienna, uh, when you enter it, there is no book. In fact, I, I went to all the floors. There are no books. It's a library without books. And of course, I like Zaha Hadid and I admire her work. But here, I see clearly it's a library, right? I, nobody has to tell me. But there, there is no book. Not not one single book. And so what kind of a library is it? This is a place to celebrate knowledge. Very much so. The cathedral of books, in a way. But maybe you know that Victor Hugo, the, the important French writer, he said that actually the book killed the cathedral because when the books began to be published after Gutenberg uh, in large numbers, the knowledge, the information, uh, the narration from the walls of the cathedral went into the pages of the books. So slowly, there was no need any longer to tell a story through the walls. So that's why he said the book killed the cathedral. And now maybe the internet kills the book. The book is still admired, but I think it's, uh, it's suffering a sunset effect. That is the sun is at its most splendid when it sets in the evening, meaning when it dies. Now, of course, the sun comes up in the morning again, but I don't know about the book. Uh, yeah, there is still a fascination with books, but uh, uh, it does go through a crisis, I would say. And it goes through a crisis even at the university in Bucharest. Very, very few students go to that library, to that uh, uh, yeah, library. And, and there is a, um, there are great books there. The, the library has great books, but very few students go there. And you wonder why. Another palace in Vienna, uh, you see the end of the 17th century, uh, all white, too white for my taste. But here are some, I like, I like, I like this picture because it shows the, the pupils, the students, you know, uh, bringing in some dynamic uh, 
movement that is uh, that is maybe necessary. Otherwise, the building is rather static. I imagine that inside there are uh, baroque uh, interiors that are of a different nature than what we see outside. Otherwise, this is a, a baroque, a restrained baroque. If I am to express myself oxymoronically or paradoxically. Baroque is the art of uh, excess, but, uh, you know, to call it a restrained Baroque is a little bit um, uh, strange or uh, paradoxical. But that's how it is. You look at the building, it's restrained. The, the tree is not restrained. It's Baroque itself, almost expre expressionistic, but the building is, uh, is quiet. The Stratman Palace in Vienna, 1692. Here it is. Not too many trees on these streets in Vienna, unfortunately. Another palace in Lower Austria, 1693. Again, I mentioned the oblongs. I truly think there is a future for oblongs. They are very useful, and with uh, with simple means, you can uh, you can uh, obtain also interesting facades, and uh, and uh, also offer something to the to the users of the buildings that uh, a degree of freedom, as I said, to to handle the to negotiate with the outside, and not just about the the, the light, but also about the noise. Nice kitchen. Uh, in, in Salzburg, uh, this is, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. He just did this part, but he also built an important church and you are going to see it. But again, we see sculptures, we see frescoes, we see a celebration of architecture through other means as well, not just architectural, but the plastic arts and sculpture and painting and architecture always work together in the past, but not in the present, as if we are doomed and nobody is uh, dooming us, so to speak, uh, but ourselves. I think there is great room here for improvement and the young students and the young architects could do something about this. A, 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 a renaissance to bring back the arts to architecture. There are plenty of artists in Romania and all over the world who have nothing to, to work on because they are condemned to work in the attics uh, or basements for so-called private works when they could use could be used for uh, uh, you know collective uh, uh, actions you know uh, for uh, the urban uh, uh, place for uh, for uh, all kinds of buildings i truly think there is a great potential here which should be explored sooner better sooner than later another palace from 1697 um, So this is Central Europe, is Austria, uh, and is uh, the end of the 17th century, the beginning of the, the 18th century. Now, this is an important church in Salzburg from 1699. Now, this year is referential, but uh, of course it was not built just in one year. Impressive the landscape though in, in Salzburg. This is uh, the other discourse, the drone discourse, the architectural discourse that is done graphically, and it has its importance as well. 
for, for culture in general and for architecture in particular, a drawing has its importance, even if the building was not built. And even if the building was, was built, in both cases, the drawing is important. So I suggest to the students to, to do nice drawings and to keep them, to take care of them, to have affection for those drawings. They will constitute your portfolio and they will be, you know, uh, uh, samples of uh, your evolution as an architect. A palace from Salzburg, 1700. Now it's a casino there, what can we do? Holy Trinity Church, also in Salzburg, the end of the 17th century, the beginning of the uh, 18th century. It seems there was spring there too when the picture was taken. Then the trees are magnificent. Another church also in Salzburg. So he worked a lot in Salzburg, not only in Vienna, Vienna but also in Salzburg and the impressive churches. Another church, also in Salzburg. I think here he did just the high altar. But I love this church. With this, it's this, uh, these incredible columns. It's very vigorous, almost modern. A palace in Vienna, 1710, 1712, white again, too white, if you ask me. Maybe it was not white when it was built, I don't know, but it is white now. Here it doesn't seem to be white. But here it does, at least a part of it. This is the Bohemian court, uh, court uh, chancellery in Vienna, 1708-1714. <laughs> it's not white, it's pink, which is worse. Another palace, Vienna. He built a lot of palaces, didn't he? Not too many apartment blocks and, uh, and uh, social housing, but a lot of uh, palaces. 1723, another urban building in Vienna. And now we see the two, the father and the son. The father on the left, the son on the right. And uh, Joseph Emanuel Fischer von Erlach was his son. And he built in Timisoara this church. Uh, he also built one or two more buildings in Transylvania, uh, his son.
this is in Timisoara by, by his son, Joseph Emmanuel, while he was uh, Johann Bertrand, Bertrand uh, Fischer von Erlach. Okay, so uh, this was about uh, Fischer von Erlach, uh, a little bit about both. And uh, now I can show you a, uh, something about Ale Giardino, uh, the, the Brazilian uh, architect I, I told you about, a uh, very interesting uh, architect. Unfortunately, please forgive me for uh, for three minutes. Uh, I, 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 will, I will be back. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you learn now about uh, an architect uh, totally unknown uh, in, in our country and uh, maybe not just in our country, but I think a very interesting, uh, a very interesting architect and uh, maybe not just an architect, but a human being a human being who struggled, like most of us, to make sense of his life. And uh, his case moves me very much. So as I said, Ale Giardino in Portuguese means the little cripple. He was crippled. He was crippled because until 30 or so, he had a, a life of uh, partying and, uh, you know, an easygoing life a happy-go-lucky life uh, because his father was a Portuguese architect and um, he contracted a terrible illness that killed most people who, who got it. But, but he, he remained alive, although he lost his limbs and arms, uh, the, you know, his hands. I read that he was, uh, you know, terrible crippled, terribly crippled, and yet, strangely, then a great change occurred in him and he changed as a human being. And he began to, 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 to do even sculptures. I don't, I understood, I read that, uh, the, you know, the, the sculpting tools were, were um, you know, attached to his, uh, to his uh, you know, what remained of his arms and, uh, you know, his slaves or, yeah, or his, uh, you know, uh, his helpers. Uh, carried him. He, he was a, a, a wrecked man. He was a, a man uh, uh, totally uh, disfigured by that terrible illness, but he took his revenge, so to speak, in art. This was the man, I mean, I don't know exactly how this portrait was generated. Uh, and we look at a work done by him almost contemporary with, with uh, what um, uh, Fischer von Erlach built. Church of São Francisco, uh, San Francisco by Ale Giardino in uh, Ouro Preto in Brazil. So it's kind of interesting to see Baroque architecture in Brazil after we saw Baroque architecture in Austria. He was a mulatto. His, his father was white, but his mother was black. And, uh, and, and uh, he was a mulatto but his architecture is brilliant and so is his culture. Now there is more exuberance here because yes, we are dealing with uh, South America, with, uh, with Brazil. Uh, uh, 
uh, towards the outside, uh, there is not austerity, but it's simpler the architectonic expression. But inside, as you saw, it's, it's very, you know, uh, uh, flamboyant. His sculptures are, are, are beautiful, you know. I mean, look at the expressivity of these figures, the prophets, the 12 prophets, and uh, also adornments on the, on, the, on the facade of the building. Again and again, we, we look in astonishment at the beauty that sculptures bring to buildings. The Christ. Ale Giadinio, the, the little cripple. The 12 prophets, the sculptures. He had help, but, but he's considered the author of these, uh, these sculptures. These as well, inside the, the building. You see the 12 prophets of Ale Giadinio. Look at the expressivity of these heads. The man suffered, no doubt. He was young when he lost his limbs and his arms. It is amazing that, that, that he kept, you know, he, he kept being alive and he kept working and he kept producing and creating. So it is possible, you know, try to value your body as it is, you know, you are healthy you have incredible riches at your disposal. You know, the internet is giving you access to the works of Ale Giardino and Fischer von Erlach. You can do projects on your laptop. You can do so many things if you have desire, if you have uh, that longing for the absolute and for beauty and for, uh, for to, me to give meaning to your lives. Yes, maybe he had to go through the terrible suffering of getting very, very, very seriously ill in order to arrive at the wisdom and the inspiration and the passion to give everything he had for these artworks. That's why I find him as a, as a beautiful example, uh, not just uh, in, in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of ethics. It's, it, it's like art found a way to, 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 to compensate for a, for, a, for a problematic life. And this is actually what art does. It compensates for the misgivings of a life that, that has problems and it has problems for all of us. On the other hand, some think, and maybe correctly, that art creates problems, even architecture. That's what, that's what uh, Tom Wiscomb, uh, said uh, just a few days ago when I showed his work that architecture is not just about solving problems. In a certain way, it's also about creating problems in, in, in the sense that it stirs, up, stirs, it, stirs us up to, uh, to imagine, uh, you know, to, 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 it, 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 it turns architecture by creating problems, it forces us to to look at reality differently, to, to escape the comfortable road of complacency. Unfortunately, this is not very, very often done because the functionalists think that this is not the role of architecture. But I think Tom Wiscomb is right. Great architecture is, 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 is provoking a change in our consciousness. It's like an awakening. Like this man, Ale Giardino, he was awakened by the tragedy he had to go through. It would have been easier if he died, but he didn't die. So then he, the, only, the only chance he had at his disposal to, to kind of make sense of his life was creativity. And uh, even if he was crippled, uh, he succeeded. I know the case of a Japanese uh, uh, professor of gymnastics, 
uh, he had an accident. So he was in Japan and he had an accident and he paralyzed from his uh, neck downwards. So he was hospitalized and in hospital, they be, he began to paint watercolors and to write poems. And he, he was in the hospital forever. After seven years or so of being in the hospital, the, the, the town uh, where, where, where he was actually a professor of gymnastics decided to build a, a, a museum for him. And I took part in that competition. That's why I, I know about him. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, a very moving case, you know, a, a man who was crippled from the neck downwards, condemned to be in bed continuously and without the, the hope of, 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 of ever getting better, he painted with his, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with the brushes in his mouth because he couldn't use his arms because he was paralyzed. Amazing. And he also wrote poetry. Can we imagine the pain of that man? Can we imagine the pain of Ale Giardino? And look what he left behind. This is what moves us, not rules and regulations, not codes, you know, but this art where, which speaks to our hearts and our imagination. This moves us. That's why it is extremely important that art comes back into the school of architecture. That is, if we want to have a sensitive form of architecture and an informed architecture and the an architecture full of passion and inspiration. We need to bring back art into the school system. This inspires me much more than uh, any kind of, uh, in fact, uh, no rule and regulation would ever inspire me. They have their role too, I agree, you know, but when you start uh, working in an office, inevitably you'll, uh, you'll uh, have contact with those, you know, reality, so to speak, of the time and place you live in. But in, in the university, I think it's important to, 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 to inspire the students with the greatest uh, in, in, in both in architecture and in art. And uh, then, then we'd have different kinds of students, I would say full of passion, of inspiration, of longing, of uh, desire to, 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 to express themselves. Bravo to Ale, Ale, Ale Giardino. He was an example. Anyway, I'm not going now to go on this presentation. I, I also have Oscar Niemeyer, but maybe, maybe I can show uh, the work of, uh, of uh, the other architect was contemporary with Ale Giardino and uh, Fischer von Erlach. And that is uh, Filippo Juvara, a very important Italian architect, also a Baroque architect, and who was also related somehow to Fischer von Erlach because they influenced each other through the engravings. So I will uh, quickly show you also a PowerPoint presentation I have on Juvara. Filippo Juvara, he was um, a little younger than, uh, than uh, Fischer von Erlach. Well, not so little, about 20 years younger, and he died a little bit later. This was the man, and uh, it's important to know of him too, because he was an important uh, Ita Italian Baroque architect. So he was an Italian architect active in a late Baroque style who worked primarily in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Juvara was born in Messina in Sicily to a family of goldsmiths and engravers after spending his formative years with his family in Sicily, where he designed Messina's festive settings for the coronation of Philippe V 
of Spain and Sicily. Juvara moved to Rome in 1704. There he studied architecture with Carlo and Francesco Fontana. That's how they studied architecture then. You know, not there were no schools of architecture. There were, you know, masters. You worked with a master and you learned the trade from the master. This can be done today too. You know, to to if you work in an office in an architecture in an architectural office, you learn a lot. Inevitably, you know, you can start from zero, and I am absolutely sure in uh, two three years, you learn a lot. I mean, if the office is creative and good and the, 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 the architects there are also inspiring, then yes, you work a lot. You learn a lot. Drawings, uh, just like um, uh, Fischer von Erlach, he uh, drew a lot and some of his drawings were engraved. He had a taste, a, a, a great appreciation for theater in a way explicitly because he also did <clears throat> did uh, stage design. Uh, in the case of Fischer von Erlach, the relationship with theater was via the Baroque aesthetics. But both architects, being Baroque architects, implicitly or explicitly, like in the case of Juvara, had an interest in theater. Great drawings. Filippo Juvara, drawings from the Roman period, what, what he studied in Rome. But I'm absolutely sure if they lived in the present, both Fischer von Erlach and uh, Filippo Juvara would have used the computer and they would have used the computer very, very creatively, you know, kind of like Tom Wis Wiscomb. And this is again something we don't do. And I wonder why. Don't we live in 2021? We do. Well, do our works show it? I'm doubtful. If you look at what Tom Wiscombe does, and if you and you look at what we do, there, is, there are great differences, because uh, we don't express the truly the, the 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 time we live in, which is a complicated time. Is uh, web-like, is like, not like, is uh, the you know the uh, the digital web, the internet, uh, the age of communication, the the great technologies that we have, all these things should be present in our work, but more than just drawing digitally, you know, something that we could have done manually anyway. That's not what Tom Wiscomb does. He uses the computer very creatively. Even uh, by uh, breaking the computer, as he himself has said, breaking the tools in order to break them, you need to use them and you need to know how to use them. Anyway, um, I like the motto of the of the secessionists in Vienna. Uh, the secessionist movement was an artistic uh, and architectonic movement at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century. On the, on, on the facade of the secessionist building in Vienna is this uh, motto, this, this saying, to each, uh, to each age its art and to each art its freedom. Beautiful. And this we should remember also. To each art, to each age its art, to each art its freedom. So art is supposed to, to express the truth of its time, not other time, its time. And in order to do this, it needs freedom. I don't know why some people don't get it.
Jovar again, and the theater of the world, the theater of the of the city, and the theater of his imagination. The Basilica of Superga, 1731. Uh, I'm not going to read now because it's uh, I already uh, um, you know this is the third presentation now, but. Uh, uh, this is a church on top of a hill, and it took a long time, I don't know, 20 years. It was hard to bring the construction materials on top of the, on top of the hill. He built it, and look at this, gloriously so. Baroque again, Baroque architecture, Baroque art. Oh, I don't know, this uh, facade maybe is rather almost neoclassical, but uh, the, in the interior and also some parts of the building here are, are, are Baroque. It's a basilica, Scopoli, in Italy. He also built in, uh, in, in, uh, in Spain, and uh, we will we'll see that those works as well. A very important architect. Juvara. Not just for his built work, but also for his drawn work. And I think he even published a, a treatise uh, on, on architecture. So these architects, not only they drew and not only they built, but they also were interested in, in the history of architecture, in theory and philosophy. As we should be as well. This is just one, one church, but he built several and palaces as well, just like um, uh, Fischer von Erlach in Austria. A great uh, cupola. Santa Cristina, just the facade in Turin or to Torino in Italy. He did several buildings in Torino. Uh, the facade is obviously Baroque. Uh, it's this building, and but I see they, they built a, an almost identical one here. I don't know if he was responsible for this as well. He built this one. This one is not adorned with, uh, with so many sculptures. It's a little bit less rich. Otherwise, it's almost identical. This was built by Juvara. The facade. You cannot have a great architecture without emotions. It's impossible. It's impossible, uh, you know, it's, it's an emotional art. That's why it's even, uh, you know, so often uh, associated with music. Both music and architecture are abstract arts. They both use an abstract uh, method of notation. But <clears throat> in the end, uh, they are supposed to express emotions. You know, architecture is considered frozen music. Could we have a music which is not emotional? No. Well, if uh, architecture is frozen music, well, it is frozen, but it is music. Then it's supposed to have emotion. Emotion in, in the stone, in, 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 in the matter that it works with. Never forget emotion. I kept saying, kept quoting from Paul Valéry, who you've probably heard me already saying this, but I will repeat. 
that there are three build three kinds of builders one who puts a stone above another stone is a builder one who places a stone above another stone and makes them talk or speak is a master builder and the third one who makes the stones sing there the music sing his name is eupalinos ul architect or the architect only the one who makes the stones sing truly deserves the name architect or to be named an architect how you make the building sing i don't know it's up to uh, whoever works but uh, the purpose is this one yes to bring emotion into the building into the inert matter palazzo madama again the facade not just the facade he also did the, the grand staircase behind the facade we are going to see it but the facade is glorious uh, in, you know in in the using the language of, of of the baroque yeah he also designed this staircase and the space um, around it i am tempted to think that these architects were lucky because they didn't have to handle uh, parking lots and uh, all that uh, stuff that we have to handle could you make a baroque uh, parking lot i don't know <laughs> maybe it would be an interesting project so this is juvara uh, the palace of venaria he worked with a few other people it's not very clear to me what he did but i think this room this hall this long one uh, was done by him and it does look impressive it's a huge palace and there were several architects involved it wasn't again very clear there are all kinds of buildings so i i i couldn't uh, i couldn't really find out precisely what he did but he did this one a great a great room a castle of rivoli uh, again working with uh, with uh, three other architects this one has some ruins but it still looks impressive look they are just ruins but the spirit of, ar of architecture is alive i would say very much so as jeme cantacuzino said about the columns in persepolis for the spirit are enough even if there are just some scattered columns here and there at persepolis for the spirit is enough said uh, Jeme Cantacuzino. That's how I guess it was at one at one time. That's how it is now. Somehow it's more interesting now, I think, than when it was too monolithical and too grandiose and too, you know, uh, so-called majestic. I like this picture. Sorry about the, those notations on the belonging to the photographer, but uh, you know, even the power of ruins. No, the, uh, this is a wounded building, but even if it is wounded, I think it is impressive. An idea is to, you know, I, I even thought of wrinkled, wrinkled buildings or wounded buildings. Try to make a wounded building. How would you make it? 
Why are we hiding the wounds? A building should also be like a human being. If a human being is wounded, like Alei Jardinio was wounded, why shouldn't we also sometimes, depending for some uh, program, uh, you could make a, a, wounded, uh, a wounded building or a wrinkled building. How would a wrinkled building look like? Another church, Church of San Filippo Neri in Turin, a uh, large church. Uh, the outside doesn't impress me too much with this uh, kind of neoclassical uh, entrance, but the inside is, uh, is, is nice. Uh, Italy has so many churches that, uh, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to choose, so to speak, or to see them even all. Every city has splendid, uh, splendid churches. And you'll see actually a beautiful uh, church that is described as being bizarre in his hometown in Sicily, which I like very much, <clears throat> maybe more than almost all his buildings. And it's just a little church. Yes, these this, uh, frontons of his church churches uh, um, don't, don't impress me uh, as being highly emotional. The Church of Santa Croce, also in Turin. This is a nice church. It's a small church, but um, although it is whitish, and, uh, but it is, uh, it's not a cylinder. It's not based on a circle, but on the ellipse. And uh, thus, it is uh, baroque because the, the ellipse is the problem, problematization of the circle because it has two centers. A, a, an ellipse is made of two circles with two centers. I think it was damaged during the war, Second World War and uh, they restored it. Many great, great buildings fell during the Second World War. And I think we should try our best to avoid another war, if possible. A drawing by, by him, or I don't know what it is, was published in a book or anyway. Uh, Yeah, you see, wounded. And I, I, I truly think you can make a very interesting architecture where you don't try to hide the wound, but to, 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 uh, to be a source of, of creativity and inspiration. Another castle with Guarino Guarini, a great, 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 great uh, architect himself. One day I will talk about Guarino Guarini as well. Uh, this is not Guarino Guarini, perhaps, but uh, it's, it's, this is maybe going over the board, so to speak, in terms of Baroque richness. The outside is not so, uh, you know, uh, uh, heavy, so to speak. But it's hard to know exactly what he did. He worked with four other, three other people. Yes, the Baroque could be tiring, uh, you know, sometimes when, when it's too opulent. Now, Chiesa Madonna del Carmine in Torino, <clears throat> the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of the 18th century. The exterior is not so impressive, but uh, the interior is, I think. 
the way the light is uh, fragmented and filtered through these arches and it's cultural, it's, it's moving. But this one as well, you see the effects of the Second World War. Amazing that the Italians were able to restore it to, um, you know, uh, significant extent. Palazzina di Caccia of Stupinigi, I don't know what this is. Ah, yeah, yes, it's a palace. A palace and it's interesting the site the plan uh, you know uh, the the uh, if you look at the top view but even here you can see that uh, as opposed to Schönbrunn by Fischer von Erlach here you have that courtyard uh, and then uh, you know uh, uh, some other angles not just uh, uh, not just the 90 degrees angle and here also there are impressive interiors a chapel, I imagine, part of the uh, of the ensemble of the of the castle. So Filippo Juvara, and uh, a contemporary, uh, uh, a little bit younger than uh, Fischer von Erlach, but as I read, they influenced each other with the engravings. Here you see better how the how the, the whole uh, complex of buildings was done. I think he also worked here on the gardens. The royal palace of La Grania of uh, the San Defonso, uh, gardens, the palace, lots of buildings, lots of gardens for the rich and famous of their time. They're all gone. This is the human destiny. We are born, I mean, I shouldn't maybe say this, it might sound a little bit morbid, but it's true. We are born in order to die. And even the most powerful and the most famous one day will be gone. So maybe we should never forget this and spend our, our earn our lives if we can. I think it's more important to earn one's life than to earn a living. Of course, we all have to earn a living, but we shouldn't remain there just to earn a living. We have to earn one's life, our lives, which is not easy. And the other one is not easy either for, for, for many people. Out here, the interiors are more austere. Uh, this is the church that I told you about. It's a small church, very special, very different, very something strange. He built in his own hometown. He was born in Sicily, in, in Messina, and he built this extravagant little church, which I like very much. Look at this, it's here. And there are some references to Borromini here. Um, I, I, I like it. It's, 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 it's exotic. It's look at this. Look at this little church. It has some kind of an oriental ornamental exuberance. And uh, yes, it is, uh, it is different from all the other buildings he built. Messina, Sicily, Filippo Juvara. There was there was this destruction here too. Uh, 
uh, look at the interior. This is almost close to, uh, you know, uh, the interior is not too far away from the uh, horror vacui of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, the interior. Because in a Greek Orthodox Church, we cover everything with icons, with all kinds of uh, uh, iconographies relating to, to, to the liturgical uh, uh, space. Uh, you know, you, you won't see too, too many uh, Orthodox churches with uh, blank white walls. Now, anyway, Filippo Juvara, architect, of the, you know, he, he worked. This is also an interesting building, Quartieri Militari in Turin. Um, now is some kind of a cultural center there. Uh, it, you know, they are urban, urban buildings. They are not uh, religious in nature, but they were, they were actually built for the military. Here you see the plans. And here is a view from, uh, I don't know, before the war, maybe be before, between the, the, the first and the second world wars. I like these old photographs, but that's maybe because I'm a nostalgic man. I, I like to witness the passage of time. And all photographs are, are, are moving, you know, aging uh, paper, aging photographs. You know, or like here, you see no cars, you just see the trees and you see the buildings. On top, the engraving of the same thing that you see at the bottom, the present. Filippo Juvara in Turin or Torino. A drawing by Juvara of the same uh, building or buildings. There are two buildings. That's it. So um, that's what I was able to bring to you today. Uh, I thank you for uh, participating. Uh, 